Okay. Hello. How's everybody? Good to see you. Sorry you've all crammed into this uh, space, but at least there's air conditioning. And good evening to everybody on Zoom or tonight. All right. So what I understand, let's come on in and have seats. What I understand is that we're going to be embarking tonight on a the first of a four-part series that looks overall at the relationship between God and Israel and Israel. And we're going to start with the base of that, and that is the covenant, the Berit. Um, now, of course, whenever we're go you know, we have to deal with these things, I feel like I say this every single class, because we are dealing with the early treatments of these things. And what I mean by early treatments is that we are not in, on level 10 yet, right? We're at the very beginnings. And so at the very beginnings, we're going to always deal with things in broad strokes. And when we get through those, as the years go by and the time goes by, we'll be able to unpack that more, be able to develop that more and understand the more, the more intricate, detailed aspect of these broad ideas that, that we're going to be presenting essentially at the beginnings um, of our study process. So what I'd like to do for you tonight is to, is to present an orientation uh, regarding the nature of the Berit, the nature of the covenant. And that means that not only do we want to look at the covenant itself, but how it is that it came about, how it is that the Torah presents it to us in various ways, and what its implications are. Um, because all too often, we tend to, we are very used to in our, our modern day uh, Judaism, certainly in Orthodox Judaism, to look at the component details or mechanisms of the Brit, but not the Brit itself, right? How, how it functions and why it functions. Uh, and it's important for us to be able to understand that because in order to be able, because when we understand that, we then of course better understand the constituent elements that come into play in terms of the active elements of the covenant, what it is that our investment is in the covenant, what's expected of us, how it is that we see those things. When we understand the framework of it, we have a much better understanding of all of the details, right? So that's what we're going to try and do tonight. First thing is, so here's where we start. And where we start is relatively unconventional because, again, when I say that, I mean in terms of our modern mindsets, because we are so used to the uh, rabbinic glosses on this that we do not look at it on its own. So to give you an example for this, right? When I was uh, heading Bar Yeshiva and our curriculum included the study or that not really the study, but more the reading of, learning of the entire five books of the Torah. So the students at Bar Yeshiva, uh, they still do this today, I believe. Um, but we just set up the curriculum for it and the system for it. They begin from first grade, which is about six years old, until um, sixth grade, about 11 years old, to study the five books of the Torah. And when I say study, I don't mean depth. They read the psukim of the Torah, and they have a very basic translation of it, but the translation only comes after the reading of the Pesukim. They don't have translation before. There's a bit of an orientation of what it is we're going to be reading about, but otherwise they read the Pesukim, and then from those Pesukim, they have a basic pshat, what we would call a pshat, and then uh, they read the Pesukim again. They, they get these Pesukim over and over again. Um, and they don't study these Pesukim with any commentary, really any official commentary. They certainly don't study it with Rashi, no other official commentary. And they only begin studying the Perush of Rashi. And the only reason they do that is because it is commonplace in the Jewish world to have some familiarity with Rashi. And so, so as not to uh, rob them of that, we, we bring them into that, to that study. But the reason why I restricted that until at least seventh grade, which is when they're 12 years old and have finished already the five books of the Torah on its own, is because when you teach a child a pasuk with Rashi from the time that they're young, that's what they always have. They always have Rashi grafted onto the pasuk, and they cannot extract the perush of Rashi from the pasuk because that's their initial ex experience of it. 
which then, of course, restricts them from being able to study any other pirush on that pasuk without the gloss of Rashi grafted onto it. But when you teach them the pasuk, they have the pasuk. And from there, they can study anything on that pasuk, but they at least know the pasuk. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at the, the presentation of the Birit, and, and for that matter, the presentation of God to Abraham, which is where everything starts, and recognize that all of the things that we know about that interaction is a gloss of the Hachamim, not to discount the gloss of the Hachamim, not to take it away or to minimize it in any way. It's all very important. We need to be able to understand why the Hachamim gave the commentary that they did on what it is that we're reading. But we must see what we're reading as it is before we start to entertain that gloss. And here is the opening point. The opening point is, is that it seems from the Pesukim, right, from the text of the Torah, that God begins talking to Abraham for absolutely no reason at all. And not only does he just begin to talk to Abraham, he engages with him very personally. So he says to Abraham, Lech lecha. it's the first thing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Abraham, go for yourself, leave your father, leave your birthplace, leave everything that you know, to where to land that I'm going to show you. Oh, and I, by the way, Abraham, I'm going to make you this huge nation. I'm going to make you into this huge nation. You're going to be an Abraham on Goim. I mean, he hit the jackpot, a lottery out of nowhere. So it's not just like Akadosh Baruch who comes to Abraham and says, listen, Abraham, I thought it would be nice if we get to know each other. You want to have a coffee sometime and maybe we can talk and see if you'd be interested and maybe, you know, uh, going into eternity with me or, you know, maybe want to date a little bit and see how, how things, none of that, right? Akadosh Baruch who comes to Abraham and simply says, I'm giving you everything. And the way that the Pesukim presented to us is that this happens to Abraham from God with no prior evidence of any kind of relationship, any kind of merit, any kind of anything. All of that, if at all, needs to be completely filled in by the Hachamim because it's not present in the Mikra. So the Hachamim will come along and say, well, I mean, Abraham was a special kind of guy spent his whole life searching for God and so on and so forth. It was all lovely, but it doesn't say that. We have to fill that in. And so it is important before we start to recognize all of that, that the Sukim themselves present HaKadosh Baruch Hu's involvement with Abraham as completely spontaneous and full on from day one. The question is, what does that tell us? What is it? Yeah, but he's not, the, he's demanding, but he's also giving. It's unconditional. And not only is it unconditional, it's spontaneous, and it seems to be intense. Like, Akadosh Baruch was saying, I want to make you the biggest thing since sliced bread. And this is not even before, this is before sliced bread, like several thousand years before sliced bread. I want to make you the biggest thing. It's odd. But it's only odd if we look at it as though God is doing some kind of, uh, you know, analytical, uh, academic kind of legal thing, as opposed to God falling in love with Abraham. Now, that, of course, makes us very uncomfortable because God's not supposed to fall in love because he's God. Well, that's true, but God's also not supposed to do anything because he's God first. Right? So the minute that you say, well, God doesn't fall in love, you also say God doesn't love at all. Because you can't have both. right? You can't have one and not the other. If we're going to talk about love with regards to God, then we're going to talk about love and all of its facets with regard to God. Because what is love if not a human uh, experience and emotion and engagement? I mean, obviously what we're doing is in the Torah, we are attributing these human experiences to a non-human, an utterly non-human God. And we know that we're doing that. So what does Harambam have to do with all of that? Harambam will come in and say, look, it's important for us to know that those things are not actual or what we might call literal. But even though they are not literal, doesn't mean that they are not extremely important and meaningful. Yeah, right? Things cannot be literal and at the same time be extremely important and meaningful and require us to relate to them 
as though they are so. I'm going to repeat that because that is an important point. Even though things are not literal, they are still and likely can be extremely meaningful and require us nonetheless to relate to them in their non-literal way, as though they are so. So I'll give you an example of this, right? An example that I had when I was talking with Donald Hoffman, who has this entire theory about the world and everything that we know about the nature of the world as non-objective reality, including time space, right? Space time. So everything that we experience with all of our senses is really a user interface to what objective reality really is. It's not literal, but it doesn't mean that it's not meaningful and important and requires us to engage with it as though that it is. So the example that he gives, which I think is a useful example, is that if you have a file on your desktop, right? Or for example, you have you know these, uh, these people here, these Zoom people, right? So we know that they're there and we're supposed to interact with them as though they live in these little boxes. Right? A, we know that they are not present at all in this 2D uh, representation of them. Right? Now, even the image of these people right, does not really uh, present, it's not really these people in those boxes. And yet it helps us tremendously to relate to the fact that they are actually in those boxes and to engage with them as though they're actually there. They are not there. Right? They can't be there and there and there right? at the same time. It's just not, this is not what's happening. This is all a strange representation of a reality that doesn't objectively exist. It is not literal. right? Asaf Fadida is not literally in the middle of this particular TV set, right? this TV screen. Yeah? He just happens to be represented in this strange interface that way so that we can remember him and that he can listen and whatever it is. But somehow it's important for us to be able to relate to him and his friends in that little grid, you know, as though they are actually there and present. And we do, we actually relate to them at their presence, as though they're present, right? But they're not, not to make them feel as though they're not present. We want them to feel as though they are present, which is a whole thing, yeah? And we're not present for them on their screen either in any real way. And yet, it is extremely important for us to interact with it as though it is so. And so I could actually, I mean, I think it works on this. I mean, I could actually like, you know, let's take Vidat and move him around. Can I do that here? You know, oh, I can't, it doesn't work on this. It works on my Mac, I don't know how to do it. Here we go, no? I could, who should we remove? All right, in any case, you understand that I can manipulate this as necessary, I can mute them and whatever it is, right? But even when I mute the person, I click on that little uh, microphone icon. That's not an actual microphone, that little red thing over there. That's just some user interface that allows me to interact with the code that actually creates that reality, correct? But it's not literal. Like that little red microphone is not an actual little red microphone. It just represents something that, but it is important because if this little red microphone is not treated by me as a real thing and I walk into the restroom right now and forget that that's a thing, right? It's a, it's a little uncomfortable. It's a, probably a lot uncomfortable. So just because it's not literal doesn't mean that it isn't meaningful and it doesn't mean that it doesn't require us to interact with it as though it is so. So just because God does not love, he doesn't feel, he doesn't think, he doesn't do any of those things, it doesn't mean that we are supposed to not relate to him as though he does. To the contrary, we are supposed to relate to him as though he loves, as though he gets angry, as though he gets happy, as though he gets, you know, he, 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 he's moody and so on and so forth. All of that is represented in the Torah and all of that is meant to be read by us as though it is so in the Torah. Even Haram Bam agrees to that. He just doesn't talk about it a lot because he doesn't want to talk about it a lot because his old point was don't think it's literal. So Haram Bam's whole life was dedicated to please don't think this is literal because people used to look and say, well, there's Alan Bechor and that's really him. But it's not really him. Sorry, Alan. Right? And so 
Harambam needed us to be able to relate to the Zoom grid as a Zoom grid and not as real people in real time actually there, which is how people used to relate to God. So Harambam's whole thing was just stop thinking that way. But once you stop thinking that way, of course you can definitely interact as though it is that way, understanding the entire time that this is a user interface. You with me? Okay, so once we have established that, we can then read the Torah, because without that, you cannot read the Torah, because the entire Torah disintegrates. And literally, I have nothing that I could possibly say about God, because anything that I say is already an aberration. As it says in Tehilim, Lecha Dumia Tehila. For you, God, the only real place is silence and stillness. Who are we kidding? Right? But we're using an interface. And so we understand that you know that I know that you know that I know that it's a user interface. And that's how we know. Why? Because you made me in the user interface. So that's how I deal with it. So if we're going to say that God loves it all, then we can say that God falls in love. It's part of love. And that's how we're expected to see HaKadosh Baruch Hu's interaction with Abraham Avinu. Abraham fell in love with Abraham. And he didn't need a reason to talk to him. Because anybody who's ever fallen in love knows that the minute that you fall in love, if you try to start giving reasons for it, it breaks down. It's, it's futile. How are you supposed to describe that in detailed terms? You can't. But you do know that you're just overcome with a, a desire for connection with this other entity. And suddenly everything about them becomes important. Now, it's, it, what that means is when, when it's God, it's going to be as perfect as it can be, right? So it's not going to be some codependent lunatic love, right? It's going to be, it's going to be like a wholesome, real, proper love. Where God is totally strong in himself and, you know, has his boundaries and he encourages Abraham to have his boundaries, which is precisely what he encourages Abraham to do because he wants to love Abraham so much, quote unquote. He says, Abraham, I need you to be you. Because if you're not you, I really can't love you because there's no you to love. So, lech lecha. Why don't you take a trip, you know, and set out to discover yourself away from your family and your origins and all of that, because that muddles things, because you only see yourself in terms of these origins, right? Why don't you step out? Go find yourself. Don't do it for me. Don't do it for me. I don't want it to be for me. Lecha. Go do it for you. Because HaKadosh Baruch very easily could have said to Abraham, Lech li. I mean, he says that in other places. Li teruma, right? I want them to take teruma for me. Not for them. It's mine. But you go for you, Abraham. Lech lecha. Right? And he says this twice to Abraham. This flanks Abraham's life. It's lech lecha la aretz asher ha'ekan. It's lech lecha la aretz ha'moriah. Yeah, that's, there's these two lech. These be, flank the entire growth period of Abraham's life. So, understanding that, yeah, we have to understand then what are the implications of God falling in love? I mean, why? What, what is that about? And doesn't that create problems? Right? Well, one thing it does is say, well, it wasn't you know, just God saying, mm, uh, you, right? No, there's something about Abraham that's attractive to God, right? So that opens up the Hachamim's discussion, right? What would God fall in love with? We can kind of broadly you know, entertain what would God fall in love with? What would make sense, so to speak? For God to fall in love, and even that is 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 missing because you can't really make sense of why. I don't know why I fell in love with you because there's something about you. Yet, yeah, but what we know is that it's not just something about you; it's you, the whole you, right? When you fall in love with someone, you're falling in love with someone, not a part of someone, not their mind, not their thoughts, not their behaviors, all of it. The behaviors, the thoughts, the things, uh, how he, you know, his funny little accent, maybe a little, uh, you know, a little twitch that Abraham had, or whatever, the whole thing, the whole thing, which is why when it starts to develop, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is interested in not Abraham's students, but Abraham's biological offspring. 
He wants Abraham's DNA, not Abraham's thinking. If he wanted Abraham's thinking, then he would be Abraham, everyone that you teach and anyone that learns from you is who I'm connected to, which would make more sense. Because you would think like, you know, all right, so the Hachamim say, what's all these people that they spoke to in Haran, that they encouraged to recognize God in Haran, that's how the Hachamim understand that Pasuk. Great, so these are like disciples. Or they're people that, you know, drank Avram's Kool-Aid. And they're in the program. So these should be the people. Because Abraham, you and Kola Nefesh Asida Beharan are my people. That's not who HaKadosh Baruch Hu is interested in. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is interested in Abraham's biological offspring. Which makes sense if you understand that. HaKadosh Baruch Hu Of course, I mean, well, that's of course who I want. I want Abraham's being, right? The, the offspring of Abraham's whole person is who I'm interested in, which we can also relate to as human beings. Because you love somebody, their kids suddenly are more meaning. You see somebody you love, right? And they have kids. And you see these kids in a, in a playground with a whole bunch of other random kids. You're gonna tell me that those kids are not special to you just because you love their, their parents? Of course they are, for no reason except that you happen to love their parents. It's a weird thing, but there's something about these kids that relate to the person that I love. And I love them because I love the person. And so on and so forth. So it's very interesting that this is the mechanism, right? This is the nature of the interaction between Akadosh Baruch Hu and Abraham Avinu, and for that matter, his biological offspring. And even the biological offspring that don't make it, right? There, are, there is a program here, right? There are some biological offspring of Abraham that don't really maintain full inclusion in this deep, intimate interaction with Abraham, but they're never thrown out. They just don't have full, intense covenant. But Yishmael, I mean, all Abraham has to say to God is, uh, right? maybe Yishmael, uh, he can like live in front of you. Like, you know, Agadosh Baruch says two words. Yishmael, Shematicha. Nice play on the words. Oh, about the Yishmael, I've heard you about him, right? Which is what Yishmael means. Yishmael means may God hear. Yeah, and God's, oh, no, I heard. Don't worry. He's good for life. He will not have to worry. I take care of him for all time. Him, his kids, his grandkids, they're going to be very special. Oh, and Isab also, where Isab is absolutely protected. As a matter of fact, Akamim call Isab in the Talmud Israel Mumar. He's an Israel that went off, left the belief system, but he's, always, he's still Israel in whatever fashion. Right? So there is our twin brother. His grandparents are our grandparents. Right? He grew up with Yitzhak and Rafkaz's parents. And Abraham and Sarah's his grandparents. Oh, they're very special. You know, like all of Europe. They're, they're, they're very important. And you guys also, by us, you, you don't touch you don't touch Esav. Esav, he has his thing. He has his inheritance. I've given Esav his own he, he has his thing. Why? Because Abraham. That's why. No, nah, I mean, now, if among these children that, that are of the people that you love, they behave, right, very much like their parents. And there are other children that like disassociate themselves completely from the parents. You'll still recognize that they're special. They're more special than the other kids. But the kids that really follow the way of their parents certainly resemble them more. And so that's Yitzhak and Yaakov and, you know, that, that kind of line. But it's very important to understand that the falling in love implies something, like you said, it's unconditional. The value of spontaneous love is that it is spontaneous and based on nothing but the love itself. And being that it's unconditional it cannot be broken by definition. It is not based on conditions. And that means that the covenant that HaKadosh Baruch Hu established with Abraham was unconditional. And nothing could ever happen to it. Which is indeed how it is presented in the Torah. That once you are part of this covenant, you are always part of this covenant. There is nothing you can do 
to tear it asunder, as it were. You can live unfaithfully to it. You can step on it and treat it as though it's not important. And you can be punished for that. But you cannot abrogate it. It is not breakable. Being that the covenant is not breakable, included in the covenant is the protection of God to the people of Abraham, right? In specific definition. And that means that the people of Abraham, specifically Israel, are indestructible. Nothing can really happen to the entity called Israel. Individuals can suffer severe casualties. As a matter of fact, great majorities of the aggregate individuals that make up the constituency of Israel can be completely lost. I mean, there are 10 tribes of our people that are gone. Just like that. Just gone. That's possible. It can be that the very strict reading of the terms of the covenant come into play. We see that come very close to extreme strict readings when God says to Moshe, look, Moshe, I'm going to wipe them all out and I'll leave you. And we'll start from you. Because technically, you're a great grandchild of Abraham Abinu and I'll be within my reading. It's a very broad covenant but a covenant nonetheless. So what ends up happening is there's this, there's this love and desire and so on that's expressed at the very beginning that pushes into covenant. We have not yet explained why covenant. Why is the love not enough? Right? Which we will in a moment. It pushes into covenant. Covenant becomes, because it comes from this spontaneous love, it is itself like the spontaneous love unconditional. And it cannot, therefore, be broken. This is basic understanding. Now, when Abraham's offspring become multiple, multitudes, right, coming out of Egypt, the berit, right, the covenant is now stepped up. There's a new covenant that's presented to them. Not just that they're the children of Abraham, but they, as the entity called Israel, are offered an opportunity to engage in mutual covenant with God, by merit of them being a descendant cohort of Abraham. So at Sinai, there is a new option given to them that they are able to opt out of if they wish, right? They don't, they could just, could just be the, the covenant of Abraham that's left, right? But Torah is presented to them and Torah is presented to them on condition of them accepting covenant. So at the end of Parashat Mishpatim, Torah is presented in Parashat Yitro, at the end of Parashat Mishpatim is this, is this establishment of covenant. After all the Mishpatim or a nice selection of the Mishpatim are presented to the people. Mishpatim are very important because they show the people that God is sensitive to their human lives. That the nature of their lives and how it is that they live, the derech eretz as we call it, in other words, the way of the land, the way of the earth, the manner in which human beings have learned to live with themselves, the mores and morals and, and uh, you know, uh, ethics and systems, interpersonal interactions that they have developed for themselves are recognized by God and brought into covenant by God so that they recognize that this thing is not some lofty cosmic idea. This is about you as you guys in your human lives. And I'm coming to you as a lofty God into your human interactions. What say you? And it's only after those mishpatim that the famous Naseh Venishma is said. It's not at the beginning with the thunder and lightning at the mountain. That's not a Naseh Venishma moment. The Naseh Venishma moment is when your ox scores another ox and uh, you have damages and damage should be done as well. And there are Naseh Venishma. Right? That's where Naseh Venishma comes in. Moshe gets buckets of blood, tosses buckets of blood on the people, says, here you go. This is the dam of the Berit, right? This is the blood. We're going to sign it all in blood. And everybody's, yes, we're in. And that establishes covenant based on Abraham's, which is unconditional, never to be torn asunder. So we have to look at these pisukim a little bit to be able to recognize that. I mean, the first thing that I put up on the, what am I doing? I'm sharing screen, is this on here? So this is Moshe Rabbeinu's last words in Devarim before he dies to the people among his last words. He speaks for 36 days. Right? 
He says, Hen Ladunai Luecha Shamaim Ushmea Shamaim Ha'avim Yukhul Asher Ba. The Lord your God owns everything. It's all his, right? Heavens, heavens of the heavens, the earth, the whole thing, right? It's all his. And with all of that, Rat Bavuteh Hashak Adonai Le'ehavav. You should know that it's only with your fathers that a God, Hashak is a very strange word, right? Hashak is desire. It's a very human word. God doesn't hashak anything, right? No, oh, it's used. It's a very strong, emotive, passionate word. He desired them. He wanted them. And he wanted to love them. He wanted to love them. He had this desire to love them. And by har bizar amaharahim. And therefore, he chose their seed after them. Not their disciples, not their students, their children. Because this is about loving people. It's not about teaching ideas. The teaching ideas must be understood. It's very important to understand that the ideas that are taught in terms of this grief are super imposed onto this core love and connection. They are there in order to be able to ensure the health, wealth, development, growth of the love and connection. They are not to be treated lightly by any means, but they are not at the core. What's at the core is this love and this unconditional connection and the covenant established. So he chooses their seed. And he chose you from everybody else this day. Now, this is Moshe speaking, not in Harsina. This is Moshe speaking at Arbot Moab, where a whole other level of covenant is offered. Right? So there's, a, there's, there's layers of covenant that are presented in the Torah, which we will... Moshe Rabbeinu reminds them, he says, you know, I mean, as, as things go, remember Bilam? Bilam was, had a perfect record for curses and blessings. He had it down. I mean, this man knew how to manipulate every possible odd that was out there. And he was hired for huge amounts of cash to do the same to you. And, there, and I want you to know, Moshe is saying, there is no reason that should not have worked. There's only one reason why that didn't work. And it is not because you kept the mitzvahs. It's only for one reason, because he loved you. Because God loved you. That becomes the end. You know what the hachamim say about these lines? Really, what these lines refer to. What the hachamim say about parashat bil'am, we call it parashat balak, right? Hachamim refer to it as parashat bil'am. You know what the hachamim say about that whole parasha? It should have been part of Kriyat Shema. We should have said it as part of our Kriyat Shema twice a day. That's how fundamental that whole story is. We don't do it because it's, uh, it's a little bit rough to do. I mean, imagine if you had to do it. I mean, it's hard enough to say Kriyat Shema for most people twice a day. So they didn't put it in. But nonetheless. So it's very important to understand that these are the fundamentals. And that the mitzvot, for all intents and purposes, are therefore acts of love in their greatest sense. They are legalities, no question about it, because anytime that you present a principle or an idea of how it is that people can interact, if we really care about it, then we're going to need to know their legal ramifications. And all that means is what are the practical definitions of these ideas? Because that's what legalities are. Legalities are the practical def definitions of how these ideas are to be applied in living real time. So even when I say, you know, keep, honor your mother and father, your father and mother, or keep Shabbat, and so on and so forth, well, I have to know, well, what is Shabbat, first of all? And second of all, what does keeping it mean? And how does that manifest? And what happens if I do this or that or whatever? Am I within the parameters? And that's why in love, things are very, very important. I mean, details. Anybody who recognizes who is in a loving relationship, I'm sorry about that, but I think we're keeping it on because we don't want to die. So it's better to be a little bit uncomfortable with noise than to die. If a person is in love or a person is engaged in a loving relationship, what we know about these things is that the details matter more, not less. You miss things in such a relationship. It is much more severe than missing them in casual friendships, even close friendships. There are just higher standards. And that's because everything matters. When you're measuring gold, as the Ramchal says, he says a very nice analogy. He says, when you're measuring gold, every gram counts. 
And so that's fine. But we understand that at the basis of all of it, the reason why everything counts so much is because it's all based on this concept, this loving connection. So Harambam writes about that in Hilchot Teshubah. And he says, look, I want you to understand when we say love, what kind of love we're talking about. We're not talking about like this nice uh, filial love. Filial meaning brotherly love. And where, you know, you just love all people because they're people. And you see yourself in them. And therefore, you have this love of mankind, which is very nice. And it's important. No, this love that we're talking about with regards to Kadosh Baruch Hu Abraham, remember, this is passionate, erotic, unique love. You think I'm crazy about the erotic part? We'll see in a moment. But it is. And that's exactly how we're meant to read it and see it. So it's not just that God loves. It's not just that God falls in love. It's that God has passionate erotic connection with this object of affection that happens to be the people of Israel because they are offspring of Abraham Avi. Now, before we get into reading Harambam on this, I want to understand this a bit because I said, well, why covenant? So if we understand HaKadosh, I just want to see the time we're at. What's our time frame, Rip Sinner? When are we ending? Was it, what's our time frame? When are we ending? No, okay, but when are we, really? Was it 9.30? Okay. So it's important to understand why, why covenant. The first thing that we have to recognize in order to be able to understand that question is what, what's the deal with God getting involved down here at all? Because when you think about it, the argument for God not to really care or pay attention to us and what's going on down here on this planet is very strong. I mean, we know today more than we ever have before. It used to be just an argument from the grandeur of God. But we know now today more than ever before how absolutely minuscule and insignificant our planet is in the expanse of the universe. I mean, it's hard even to get our heads around the magnet, the, the, the enormi enormity, I'll say, right, of the universe. Just the number of stars alone, for goodness sake. And forget it, I'm not even talking about our galaxy, I'm talking about the whole universe. Each one of them, like our sun or bigger. It's, just, it's staggering. I'm like, it's, 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 it's so massive that we can't even really wrap our heads around it. And oh, oh, around one of those trillions and trillions and trillions of stars, one, around one is a little rock. Literally, like this minuscule, teensy little rock that happens to be by gravitational force revolving around this star, which happens to have incubated life because of the unique proximity, which is not nuts. Because in the expanse of the universe that we have, given the odds of such a thing happening, it's probably likely that there are many of these around the universe. It's just too far for us to be able to have any kind of interaction with. This is our show. Not that nuts. And even if you want to say it's not, so we won the lottery. Okay, so it happens. It's totally random. Nothing wrong with thinking about it that way. And on this planet sprouts life because of the conditions. And then you get these bipeds that, you know, end up coming around on the planet uh, after several billion years of development that happen to be able to be conscious, which means that they're able to be aware that they're aware. And they can hold the entire universe between their ears. That's a little nuts already. That's nuts. Because the most complex structure in the known universe is a human brain by many orders of magnitude. Just by the neural, the possible neural connections alone. Okay, it's a little crazy, a little crazy. A little nuts, but nonetheless, still can happen elsewhere. And you want to tell me that whatever entity, if I accept that there was an entity, whatever that might be, which we can't really talk about, that created this entire expanse actually cares what I have for lunch? And only one of these things, you know? It's not a hard argument to make. Unless you realize that in the vast expanse of a random universe, around on one particular rock, 
life actually does start to emerge, that is able to be aware of itself and therefore aware of its circumstances and therefore aware of what might have brought it into being, that's very attractive to the entity that set it into motion. And of course, there's going to be this unique recognition of the specialness of that, which is why Dawkins called his book The Greatest Show on Earth. Really, the greatest show in the universe, as far as we know. But, I mean, like, there's nothing else going on. All he got is a bunch of hydrogen bombs. And there's nothing else going on. It's like shocking what's going on on this planet, given the rest of the universe. I mean, the entropic uh, law alone. You know, the fact that the energy that is, hap that is providing for the development and growth of life on this planet is going against what is normal. So it's just shocking. Okay, okay, okay. So maybe there could be a little bit of attention. Still, I don't know why he cares what I have for lunch, but nonetheless. But when I recognize that the entity that brought all of that into being is, again, for lack of a better term, because we have no other way of saying it, infinite, And more importantly, utterly free with absolutely no imposing force, imposition, desire of any kind external to it because there is no external to it. It is the ultimate source of all things, right? It is the ultimate, the buck stops ultimately, right? With this entity, I mean, emphatically, it, this entity is utterly free. There, there, there is no influence that imposes anything on this entity. It is all able. And there is nothing that requires this entity to do anything. As a matter of fact, this entity committing to do anything is already a restriction of this entity's freedom. So the default for this entity that we call God should be that he doesn't need to do anything that he doesn't want to do. He could do anything that he wants to do. He can say, I love you today and I don't love you tomorrow with absolutely no, no expectations of any kind. As a matter of fact, his following rules is, is on some level an aberration because it means that he is choosing to restrict himself from his natural capacity, which is why when Moshe Rabbeinu asks God for rules, and I mean, for him to run by rules, right? He says, I want to know your ways. What ways, Abraham? I don't have ways. I'm God. I do whatever. I do like willy nilly. I do what I want. No, no. You need to establish ways. <sighs> okay, fine. Kodesh Roku says, fine, I'll do that. Which is I mean, a very powerful expression of love, right? Because I said, no, I'm going to restrict my own freedoms as God and actually follow rules for you people. I'm just telling you, if I'm going to do that, you're going to need to have Yom Kippur because you're going to mess up and I'm going to want to destroy you and we're going to have to work that out. But otherwise, I mean, and I do that. And it's not, it's funny because when we recognize that God, I mean, it's not, we don't expect that God in his default is just nice. Because the way that the Hachamim talk about HaKadosh Baruch Hu is that he's Borei Olamot Maharivan. That was, his, that was his natural way of doing things. He just created worlds and destroyed them. He had no problem with, like, you know, detonating worlds. I mean, for heck, our own world barely made it through by the skin of its teeth. You can't get through the, the opening story of the Torah without the whole thing crashing and burning and almost destroyed. No? I mean, we get so excited about Bereshit, Barah, Leib, the Shemayim, the Ars, we forget that the parasha actually ends with God saying, yeah, the whole thing's a disaster. I'm shutting it all down. Literally, it's the end of the parasha. You can't get through one creation of a world without God saying, I'm done with this nonsense. And the Achamim say that's not a one-time event. That is the norm. The unique situation was that Noah pulls the world out of this thing. Again, it's Otcharaiti Tzadik Lefana. So what ends up happening? Covenant is very important for this situation because covenant, so to speak, locks God in. It's the reason why we get married. Why do we need to get married? Just say, look, I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Let's do it. No, for some reason, we recognize the need to impose this external binding agreement. And you know what the crazy thing is? For some reason, that external binding agreement limits the capacity of people to just say, you know something, I think I'm done. We do that. 
but it has it causes us to hesitate. Gotta go through a divorce and the whole thing and proceedings and lawyers' fees and I don't know, and it's gonna be a whole thing. Who gets the house? It's like it's a whole thing. So what Hakadosh Baruch Hu does, what he chooses to do, to quote unquote lock himself in because he's God and he doesn't get to lock need to lock himself into anything is when he wishes to commit to something knowing that there is any number of reasons, non-reasons, spontaneous feelings for God to shut the entire thing down, he locks himself in. The one thing about God, because he's God, is that when he gives his word, it's his word. You can fake it to the bank. So he does that with Noah, with our world. Just the world, the universe, right? Uh, or uh, Earth. I'm not going to shut Earth down by flood. Notice the covenants are very broad, right? I mean, it leaves God a lot of wiggle room, you know? Still, the very fact that he does it alone is, is, is astonishing, but he does, right? Now, that covenant is not erotic. That covenant is not special head over heels in love kind of covenant. It's, I like you all because I made you. And because I made you, I'm going to stick with you. And I'll tell you another thing. Adamu behema toshia Adonai. You know what the Hachabim say about it? Kadosh Hu says, look, I, I was getting upset because of the humans, but the reality is they're all the same. Humans and horses to me. What's the difference? I mean, I made them all. They're all just different you know, expressions of my creativity. And why should I destroy the world because the humans are messing up? The horses are nice. And I like them. And I'm going to keep them. As a matter of fact, the flies are also nice. I'm going to keep them for that too. And, you know, the centipedes and, and, you know, the hedgehogs and all those guys. We love them. And so I'm, why should I do it? Should I do it? We'll keep them. And that's what I'm saying. Adamu behema tu shiadona. And we see that in Yom Kippur, right? The last pasuk, the last words of Yonah are, Yonah, you're upset? About this kikayon, you know, this little plant that I made for you to give you a thing. And I shouldn't worry about Nineveh, this massive metropolis. Do you know how many animals are in that city? And you want me to just destroy it? Behemarabha, last two words of the of the haftara of, of Yom Kippur in the afternoon. That's what we should be thinking in our Tejuba. Do you have any idea how many animals live in the city, Yona? You want me to just, you know, poof it out of existence? I made a covenant. So that is a very broad covenant, right? And there is that kind of love that we understand. There is this love of just because you are. Just because you are part of the human race, I'm going to love you because I'm part of the human race and I see myself in you. It is undifferentiated love. And that is filial love. And that's an important love. It's important for mankind to get there. But there's a whole nother level of love. And the whole other level of love is I love uniquely, not generically. And we are comfortable with God loving generically. We are not comfortable with God loving uniquely. Where does that manifest? It manifests in Abraham. But understand what it would mean if God did not express that in Abraham. It would mean that God does not love you for who you are. He loves you just because you happen to be part of the whole thing. But you personally, you specifically, I don't see. I don't care about anybody particularly. Well, understand what that would mean. It would mean that God doesn't see you. It means that he sees you. And there is a very important difference between the two. If God does not do this with Abraham, there is no expression at all that HaKadosh Baruch said at all. And you say, well, why Abraham? Well, it had to be someone. And it happened to be him. And when someone falls in love, you don't ask, why that guy? Well, because it's God. I don't know. <laughs> what should you do? And that, by the way, is one of the things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe Rabbeinu, according to HaKamim, when Moshe says, you need to show me your ways. 
He says to Moshe, he says, Hanuti tashirachon, mehamti tashirachon. He goes, I'm going to, uh, you know, pardon those who I wish to pardon, and I'll give mercy to those who I wish to give mercy to. Say the hachamim, afat pishenu kedai. Even though he doesn't deserve it. I reserve the right as God to do whatever it is that I want, when I want, as I want. And maybe somebody will just be attractive to me, and I'll decide, you know, I'm going to let you go. Why? Because I don't have to give reasons. Right? Now, of course, we say about God that he's a tzaddik, he doesn't do avil, and so on and so forth. But this has nothing to do with tzaddik or avil. This has to do with, I feel warm towards you. <laughs> I feel attracted. Well, I'm supposed to give reasons for that. Is that a question of righteousness or not? Right? It has to do with just the nature of being and interactions. So there, Akadosh Baruch, who also has to go into covenant, because what's to say that he'll stop loving Abraham? And if it's not Abraham, the kids. And Lord knows there have been plenty of situations where that's been the case. So he locks himself into covenant because he is God. And without covenant, there is no reason why God should hold to anything at any time, which is precisely what Balaam knew, which is why another reason why the whole parasha of Balaam was meant to be part of Priyachim, because it is fundamental to the nature of the way the world runs. Being that that is the nature of the love, that it is unique, specific, passionate, it is erotic. Why? Because that's, that's the nature of human beings when we experience that kind of love, that it's you specifically, not another person. It is your whole being. That's what we feel. The most high expression of that is in the love between a man and a woman, at least classically in the majority of human history. In the majority, right? I'm not talking about small percentages. And therefore, says Harambam, not anybody else, Harambam, right? The negative attribute Harambam. He says, I want to talk to you about how it is that we should love God. And he says this, and you wonder, like, is this the same man that wrote about the fact that God does nothing, doesn't love, doesn't feel, doesn't cry, doesn't sad, not sad, not happy, not anything, right? He says, look, he goes, hey, how are you supposed to love God? What's the right way? You should love God massively. Yetera, excessively. Aza, intensely. Milod, a lot. To the point that your very soul is entwined with that love of God. That it is one it becomes one with that. Vinimsa shogeba tami to the point that you are thinking about it always. To the point that it's like you are lovesick. That's what we call people that are in that state of love. Right? Lovesick. A person who's lovesick cannot take his mind off the woman that he is in love with. Who shogeba tami thinks about her all the time. Ben Bishifto, Ben Kumo, whether he is up and around, lying down, going to sleep, whatever it is. Ben Mishashu, Ochev Bishote, whether he's eating and drinking, sometimes usually he can't eat and drink because he can't stop thinking about her. Yet, more than that, is supposed to be Ahavat Adonai Badev the love of God in the heart of those who love. I mean, how much more human, passionate, feeling oriented does one get? I mean, basically, what Harambam is saying is that. You need to be infatuated. This is the only place you're allowed to be infatuated, by the way, is with God. But you have to know what infatuation is in order to be able to know how to love God. Right? So you say, well, yeah, that's us, not God. Yeah, okay, but I mean, you know, you're not loving a benign, indifferent entity. We're expected to recognize God as loving us the same way. How do we know that? It says, It is what Shlomo says, that I am sick with love. He says that in Shir HaShirim, in Song of Songs. And then Haramam says, and by the way, The entire book of Shir HaShirim is one big analogy, one big metaphor for this love. You read the book of Shir HaShirim, and it's not a one-way love. It is an erotic, passionate love affair between a man and a woman. Woman being Israel, man being God. Well, that's Maimonides talking. 
Is that, what is it, negating everything that he wrote, the Moreh Nebuchim, which he didn't write yet when he wrote this? But he wrote it at the beginning of this book in the Yesodea Torah? No, of course not. He's doing what I said at the beginning, right? This is a user interface. You're meant to interact as though this is true, knowing all the while that, okay, I'm in the user interface, but nonetheless. And so when we understand that this is the nature of the covenant, and here is where we're going to close tonight, but I'm going to show you these examples. We understand that the covenant is uh, instigated from spontaneous love that is unconditional, that renders the covenant unconditional, and therefore impossible to abrogate. And therefore, anyone who is of the offspring of Abraham in this sense, right? Yitzhak and Yaakov, because it says Avotecha, right? Your forefathers, Hasha, you're part of this by default. Does that mean that you can't be unfaithful to it? No, you can. Does it mean that you can't spit on it? You can do that too. Does it mean that you can't be punished for it? No, you can be punished for it. Does it mean that your life could be miserable as being part of it? Uh, that too. But you can never, ever be pushed out of it. It's kind of like, you know, it happens between people who love each other. They kill each other sometimes. And then you realize, you know, oh, you say something, hey, you really hate me. He goes, yeah, I do, because I love you. If I didn't love you, if you didn't matter to me, I wouldn't even care what it was that you were doing. So I would never respond. I just let it kind of die. But it's in the passionate love that the strong feeling of anger and upset and hurt come in. And that's precisely what God says. He says, I am a jealous God. Don't you dare have any other gods in front of me. I will not put up with that. There's a lot of things I put up with. I will not put up with that. Don't you dare cheat on me. And still, the people cheat on him all the time. And what does he do? He forgives. Because I'm never sending you away. Because I love you. So what ends up happening is the following. We'll have questions at the end. What ends up happening is the following. Take a look at some of these halachot. These are the, these, by the way, on the, on the pages, those who will have the source sheet. This is the Brit as established with Abraham. The Brit is established at Har Sinai. The Brit as established by Moshe before he dies in al Bot Moab. Yeah, so you can read those and explore those. We're not going to do those now. These are examples of the love. So there's this interesting halacha that Maran brings in the Ebenai. It's mentioned in Hanabam as well. The Maran talks about it. Israel Mumar Shikidesh. A member of Israel, right? One of the offspring of Abraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov that believes in nothing. Right? He's thrown out the belief system. Right? He's thrown out the principles. Certainly doesn't do any of the mitzvot. What happens if he marries another member of Israel? Is his kiddushah of kiddushin? Right? Are the kiddushin kiddushin? Does the marriage take? Is it, does it hold in the eyes of Jewish law? Why is that a question? It's a question because if the entity of Israel is an entity because of their philosophy, then the philosophy goes, they go. Right? You stop the philosophy, you're no longer part of Israel. Except that it's not based on philosophy. Philosophy is a superimposition on the covenant. So if the philosophy is gone, and all you've got is the DNA of Abraham Avinu, which is what the Israel is, he's a mumar, which means that his philosophy is gone. He's simply a DNA uh, holder of Abraham Avinu. If he marries, kiddushab kiddushin gemurim. His kiddushin are complete kiddushin. It is a full-fledged marriage without question. Why? Because he's part of the people. Why? DNA. That's why. Yeah? And if they get married, they need a divorce. They can't just walk away from each other because the philosophy is on them. Not only that, even the children that he has after he's left the entire belief system, even if that kid that knew nothing, right, was raised as a Mumar, he didn't start off as an Israel even in terms of his philosophy, knows nothing of it. But his DNA is the right DNA. Now understand, right, how powerful this is to show how clearly it is not philosophy based. 
It is not idea based. You have a non Israel who is completely and utterly engaged and intact with the entire system of thought and belief. Knows it all. And I mean, well, not, you know, artificially, knows it all, well, bona fide, tested. He wants to marry a Israel. No go. It's shocking. Even a woman who's a Israelite, she has a child with a non-Israel. Her child is Israel. Right? So you say, why is it after the mother, not after the father? That was legislation by the Hachem, which they had entire capacity to legislate. The only thing that they could not do was pull it out of the biological situations. So they decided mother is the one. Mother is the one. For whatever reason. Not only that, it's not based on deed either. Deeds are important. Deeds are being faithful to the covenant. You don't do the deeds, you get punished. But it never, ever means that you're not part of Israel anymore, no matter what your deeds are. Why? Hata Israel, as it says in Sanhedrin, if, a, if Israel hata, they're using a pasuk from Yehoshua. Because it says in Yehoshua, hata Israel, and they were mefer the berit. That's what the pasuk says in Yehoshua. They went against the berit. Says Rabbi Abba bar Zabda, hata Israel hu. Even though he sins, he's still a Israel. Amar Biaba, yeah, Biaba says, oh, it's like what people say. You know, there's a saying that people say. A myrtle branch, right, plant that is within thorns, even though all the thorns are around it, it looks like it's camouflaged in thorns. They still call it a myrtle branch and it's, it's referred to as myrtle. Doesn't matter. Or there's this beautiful pasuk in uh, Vaikra that says, Kodesh, right? They have to do kapara for the Kodesh, which is the, the old mind. The Mishkan. You have to do that mitumot b'nei Israel from all the impurities of Israel and Pishahim and from their rebellions and kol hatotam and all of their sins. V'chen yaseh lo'el mo'ed, you do so to oil mo'ed as well. Hashochen itam betoch tumotam, right? The tent of oil mo'ed, which is where the Shekhinah rests, in the midst of their impurities, in the midst of their filth, the presence of God exists. Say the hachamim and the sefra, what does it mean hashochen itam betoch tumotam? That he lives with them or it lives with them in their tumah. Even though they're all tame, they're all filthy and impure. The presence of God rests among them. Now you say, okay, well, that's DNA. What about converts? Well, the astonishing thing about converts is that we see them as though their entire biological relationships that they had before conversion dissolve when they convert. That's a weird component. I mean, why should that be the case? They convert, aren't they just accepting the ideas and philosophies and actions of Israel? Right? Don't they have to accept the belief system and the mitzvot? No, the funny thing is, is that according to the law, they just have to have a basic sense of the beliefs. And you tell them a few easy mitzvot and a few hard mitzvot so they get an orientation and then you, you convert. What? Isn't it all about the ideas and the actions? No. It's about they want to be part of this people. That's what it is. Amech ami, Elohai, Elohai. Your Naomi, your God is my God. She never says to Naomi, right? Ruth is the classic example of conversion. Ruth doesn't say, I have now understood the true God. Ruth doesn't say, I now know what halakha is supposed to be. And therefore I'm going to. No, she says, you Naomi, whatever your people are, your God, that's what I want to be part of. Amech ami, Elohai, Elohai. Your God is my God. Your people's God, right? You. And that's what converts. So a person goes into the mikveh. When they come out of that mikveh, as a matter of fact, when they go into the mikveh, every biological relationship they have beforehand dissolves in that mikveh. When they come out, they are born anew and they are considered part of the biological people of Israel for almost all intents and purposes. There are certain limits on that. In terms of who they, they can marry Kohanim and so on and so forth, there's also Israel that can't marry, marry Kohanim. They can't have certain positions in the people. Okay, that doesn't mean that they're not part of the people. There are restrictions in particular established roles that they can't hold. How does that mean? So it means that if a brother and sister who are non Jewish go into a mikveh, when they come out, they can marry each other and. Yes. yes. 
as far as the halacha is concerned, they have no familial relationship at all when they emerge into that mikveh. And according to strict law, they're allowed to marry each other without any problem. We don't do this because it doesn't look good, because that kind of thing happens. <laughs> Which was right on cue, Margaret. Thank you. So the Hakamim say, we're going to have people saying those kinds of things, it's not a little good. But really, according to uh, no relation. Why? Because it's a biological question. It's not a philosophical question. It's not a, an action question. Which is precisely what the entire thing is based on. Beautiful quote by Herman Wolf. Yes. So if we understand this, we understand what it is all about. And it frames the entirety of our relationship, A, to the ideas, and be to the actions, because we know that the, the foundation stone of everything that we are as a people is unconditional love and covenant between God and the people. On that is the question of ideas, and on that is the question of law. Right next to that, right on the first layer of foundation is law. That's why Torah becomes the Sefer of Berit, right? That's this Pasuk in the Shemot over here. Like Kaf, Sefer of Berit is the only place in Torah where it's referred to that way, right? Because it's here, what this place, in Yitro and Mishpatim, what Moshe establishes the covenant on, pours all the blood on the people with. Like Kaf, Sefer of Berit, like Rabbeus Ne'am. Moshe takes the book of covenant and reads it in the ears of the people. They're hearing this, understanding it as Moshe is reading it to them. Everything God said, we will do and listen. So that is the next layer, right? The layer of covenant that, that allows for the covenant to function is law, of course. And what are the terms? How do we live faithfully to it? What is the nature of our engagement with God? It is active, not passive. And so, of course, law is going to be the beating heart of this covenant. It's everything, which is why the hachamim can, and, and think about it, right? in terms of covenant, we can talk about this later on, different flat. In terms of covenant, the hachamim have tremendous interaction and involvement in establishing how to convert law or the principles of law into action. Why? Because it's a covenantal inter interaction. You decide like I decide, says HaKadosh ha Baruch I've given you the principles, you deal with how it is that you apply them. It's carte blanche. There's, I mean, there's systems. There are rules, but yeah, by all means, you let me know what you decide. And we'll work it out up here. I'll just adjust the files up here and just tell me how you're defining this mitzvah right now. Fascinating, unbelievable, beautiful. But once we understand that that's the endeavor, it makes sense, of course, that the Sanhedrin should be able to run halacha that way. It makes sense, of course, that mitzvot are acts of love, that God gets upset personally, takes it personally when we are not engaged that it is important for us to understand the ideas and concepts that are the, the lifeblood of the covenant. But at its, at its core, at the scaffolding of it all, right? the foundation elements of it all, it is God falling in love with a man named Abraham, Abraham, and offering him unconditional covenant. And we are simply the descendants the biological DNA or converted descendants of all of it. So that is the opening. And on that, everything else builds. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. You've been wanting to ask a question for a long time. Right. See, it's always good to wait a little bit. And then you get, yeah. It's not fictional in the sense that it doesn't exist. It exists. It's just stand in for what objective reality actually is, because we cannot interact directly with the objective reality. In other words, if you had to deal with the Zoom stuff directly in the code, then good luck. You, even if you knew how, you'd be there for hours. It creates functionality. Does that make sense? Okay, any other? Um... In terms of biological connection, um, for the convert, she still had, or he or she still had that biology. So, how does the halakha go into mikvah? 
bring the love that's been found biologically out of it? Because when, that's a wonderful question, right? So I'll just repeat it just in case people don't hear it, right? So when you talk about the convert that still has really, I mean, you know, who are we kidding? Their biology is their biology. They are not actual DNA holders of Abraham Avinu. So how does that love manifest? Okay, I mean, think about it. So let's say, you know, you did have somebody that you love because of their biology and they fell in love with someone or someone fell in love with them. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I certainly have, right? You know, you have somebody that you care about very, very much and somebody really loves them a lot. Suddenly that person means a lot to you, right? Because you love this person and you hold them in value. So, okay, I love you. Which is similar to what HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Abraham, right? You, Abraham, I love you so much that whoever blesses you, I will bless. And whoever curses you, I will curse. Why? <laughs> like, what's, 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 just because they talk to you nicely or not nicely? Let's let them run on their own merit. No. How they react to you, Abraham, is how it's going to be better. How they engage with you, Abraham. So for a convert, right, who's a genuine Ger Tzedek, because Baruch Hu, I'm like, it's got, these people get me. They get me. Look how they love my people. So of course I'm going to take care of them and watch over them and, and so on. How can they let go of their biological connection? I don't know. That's a psychological thing. They have to talk with their therapist. <laughs> That's not for me. That's just what the laws of the Torah are. That's how the legal requirement, that's how the legal implications of the manifestation of the brief function. Good? Okay. I, there, yes. Yeah. You talk about the relationship between the God and Israel. So paradoxically, the people that saw the Galut went in Mahmoud uh, Sinai and the other people leaving, they just immediately after left everything, left the religion. Yeah. Just, I don't know, people that didn't saw anything. Yeah. It's all a psychological problem, right? Because if you have people that are stuck in a circumstance for a prolonged period of time, and these people were stuck in a circumstance of slavery for a long period of time. So their entire world was framed through the eyes of a slave. So they see the world only in terms of the eyes of a slave. The whole nature of Torah is to be able to bring these people into freedom. Why? Because you can't love freely if they're not free. What are you supposed to love a slave? It doesn't, it doesn't, there's nothing there to love, again. Right? The whole goal of HaKadosh Baruch is to bring people into freedom in order to be able that they should be holy themselves, that there can genuinely be proper mutual sharing. So the people that you're talking about were severely restricted from being able to do that. You can ask why were they severely restricted? That we can talk about when you come to my seder on Pesach, but not for now. But that's the reason why. That's one of the reasons why they were not able to emerge past Mitzrayim. They gave, they had opportunities, but they didn't make it. Their children made it, and it was, they were given opportunities. Many the, re, the the at the point of the Miragilim, when they went in and came out with what it was that they came out with, that was it. Hakadosh Baruch Hu was a ulam high end. I'm not. I'm not going to pretend like I don't exist with these people. Yom Lashana, I have to respond, I have to deal with this. And unfortunately, because they are so crippled and frozen in their slave mentalities, they can't go in. This is a land of freedom, not a land of, of slavery. So they're kids. That's it. Okay, good. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Can I end this? Yes. Okay. Well, I'll let you end that.